just jump into uh, just a little bit of uh, just welcome everybody for attending. So just a few housekeeping items here. So if you're looking to get a drink or a snack, this would be a great time to do that. Um, our team is here to help. So Eric is there. You can see him. He's a good looking guy there. You can wave, Eric. Uh, so he'll be kind of monitoring the, the chats. So if you have any questions, you can put it through the, the chat um, dialog box there. We'll take those at the end of the session. If you wouldn't mind as well, just have your phones on silent. Um, I'm guilty of this, you know, on a computer, there are so many pings and dings that, that will distract you. And um, you want to basically devote your, you know, as much attention or full attention to this because you're going to get a lot out of this session. And last but not least, but uh, this presentation, it's, uh, it's, it's unique. Uh, but there is a disclaimer in the sense that everyone's circumstances are unique. So it may not be right for you, um, just because, again, everyone's circumstances are different. So you want to consult your trusted professionals before taking on any sort of uh, investment. So a little bit about myself. My name is Tom Polievsky. For those that don't know me, um, my background originally, I was I'm born to a Polish immigrant family. We immigrated uh, back in the 80s. And I'm a graduate of Wolf Laurie University back in 2005. So I've got a background in accounting. And uh, I spent about, um, what, six years as a chartered accountant practicing. I worked for such companies or worked, my clients were like Canadian Tire, for example, Sleeman Breweries. Um, and I audited those companies. And that's what we did, what we call business valuations, where we figure out, well, what are these businesses worth? In 2009, I got started investing in real estate, in particular flipping and rentals. And I'll share with you a little bit more about that. Since about 2011, I've been a full-time realtor. This is my bread and butter. And in those nine, 10 years, I've been involved in over a thousand transactions. So not only helping investors, but helping families move from A to B. So we've seen a lot in those nine, 10 years. And as not last but not least, you know, my passions, as you can tell from the photo there, are my two boys, Nick, Nick and Alex, and I'm a big Blue Jays fan. So I heard they're going to be starting the season in July. So we'll see what happens there. So as far as our agenda is concerned, um, we've done this presentation a few times. However, we're going to probably incorporate some more market stats because I think what people want to hear is how has COVID-19 affected the market today? So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. As well, we're gonna jump into my story, how I got started in flipping properties. And then I'm gonna show you the formula of how we actually do flip properties. So it's more about theory. It's a little bit of, you can say it's a little bit boring, but it's theoretical as far as our approach is concerned. But we're gonna jump into what we call the, pra the practical. So we have our guest speaker, Tina. She's a client of mine. She's flipped numerous properties. She's gonna share with you today our experiences and lastly we're going to show you how you can take next steps so seminars are great to attend but it's all about taking action and we're going to share with you how you can take action today we've also got some upcoming events that we'll share with you that you can you can certainly register in the future and we'll conclude with questions so april 2020 why that is pretty significant, it's the first full month since COVID-19 took effect. So the, we found that March was when it started, but it started about March 15th or so. So when we were comparing March 2020 versus March 2019, it was hard to judge the effect just because uh, March in itself was actually a pretty decent month. So now we have April 2020, which has the full effect of COVID-19 and, and what it has, uh, how it has impacted the market. So the chart on the right here will show you, for example, it will compare April 2020 versus April 19. And what you'll see here, a few stats will jump out at you. First is the number of sales. So in April of 2020, we sold just shy of 3,000 homes. In April of 19, 9,000 homes. So that represented a drop off of 67%. Now what's interesting about that is when I meet with sellers, like I met with a nice Polish family yesterday and they were actually quite surprised that any homes were selling because they were on the impression that everyone was self-isolating, staying at home. And basically the market was at a standstill. The reality is our market has 
kind of paused, but it's still moving forward. And you can tell 3,000 people decided to transact in real estate during this month of April. Our active listings shrank from 18,000 to 10,000. So 41% less supply. So again, our demand has decreased, our supply has decreased, and it's, our average prices are about even. So when you compare the average price of 2020 versus 2019, it's about 820 or so. Now what's an interesting stat though is averages are simply averages and there's more to it than just that. But what we found or what the, at least the Toronto Real Estate Board found was that they have this, what they call home price index, which simply represents prices for typical homes with consistent attributes from one period to the next. What that means is that they're gonna, they will measure it based upon taking similar homes and seeing if there is a difference. Because if you compare averages, you may notice that you sell fewer $2 million homes, but more $5 million homes, well, obviously your average price will drop. But it's not necessarily representative of that particular area, if that makes sense. So what they found was that the average home actually went up 10% based on this statistical index. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. That being said, since March 15, we did see a drop off in the average price of about 9%. So I met, for example, with someone yesterday and they were thinking they could possibly get the same price that they could have got back in early March. And the reality is that the prices have adjusted since. Now, depending on your perspective, that could be good or bad. If you compare it against March, certainly it would be nice to get that price that was achievable then. But if you compare it to March of a year ago, it looks like that we're up from last year overall. So again, it's just a matter of perspective. So that's essentially the market in a nutshell. Now, jumping into flipping, which is the topic of today's discussion. Uh, my story, how I got started. So as I mentioned, I'm a graduate of Wolf Laurie University. I have a background in accounting. Uh, I actually have my designation as a, as a chartered uh, professional accountant. Now, what I found when I started getting into the working world is that my salary was not enough. And what I quickly realized there were things such as taxes and personal expenses that were essentially taking away a lot of what I had, a lot of my hard earned money. So I looked for ways to create wealth. And one of those ways was real estate. And um, at some point in my life, I actually decided to uh, take a hiatus away from what I was doing. And I actually decided to venture into different spaces. And one of those spaces was actually real estate. So you'll see here, this was actually the first property I started flipping. And I actually did what we call a joint venture uh, with my father. And he approached me with a property that was purchased for 117,000. This is a townhouse in Mississauga. It was actually a power of sale, a bank sale for 117,000, if you can believe it. This was March 2009 we're talking about here. And we had this 50-50 arrangement where he would be the, what we call money partner, and I would be the working partner. I'd be the one basically facilitating the trades, uh, taking care of the management of the project and making sure things are on time. And through this process of this learning experience, we actually ended up selling this property for 170,000. And between the two of us netted about 25,000 in three months. And I was pretty blown away by it. At that time, that was, that was um, a pretty decent return, especially on that size of property. Eventually I got back into a new career in 2009, went back into a role in, the, in, um, in, in a company, but on the side, I was actually still flipping properties. So from that experience, I was actually flipping two, three a year, making 20, 25,000. So on top of my, my day job, I was actually doing this on the side and I was essentially almost doubling my income. I liked it so much that in 2011, I decided to become a full-time realtor. And this is what I've been doing ever since. And half of business I do today is helping families move from A to B or traditional sort of residential real estate. And the other half actually is in investment properties, whether it is flipping or even long-term buy and holds. So what are the most important aspects when it comes to flipping a home? So a lot of people get caught up in terms of flipping. They, they look at home um, HGTV, they look at those programs and they get caught up in, for example, things such as what sort of finishes they're gonna use, they're gonna get the tiles, the flooring, a whole host of things. But really it comes down to just what I call the three pillars of a successful flip. The property, the financing, and the contractor, okay? 
why those three are important is if one is missing, essentially you've got potentially a flop. So let's break this down a little bit here. So property, does the opportunity make financial sense? And these are the typical questions that are associated with property is, am I getting a good deal? What can I sell it for in the future? Will the property actually sell? Is it marketable? What is the condition of the home? Are there any hidden defects? Is it in a good neighborhood? These are typically the questions around the property. Now financing, why is financing important? Of course, if you don't have the financing, how are you gonna buy the property? How are you gonna finance the operation like any other business? People, these are the common questions that I get. Where am I gonna get the money? How can I finance this? What are the different methods? What is it gonna cost me? And will I qualify? And last but not least is contractors. Who's actually gonna do the work? I mean, where are you gonna find these people? Are they gonna be on time? What are they gonna charge me? Well, are they gonna be late? Are they reliable people? And essentially, if any of these components are missing, you may have a potential flop. So we're gonna break these pillars down into some more specifics here. So pillar number one, property. So what do we look for as far as buying a property is concerned? So this is a kind of a general outline of things that we look for. So location and area. Because we're looking at something in the short term, we want areas that are gonna appreciate and, and not necessarily going to stagnate or go in a downward market. So as we're holding that property for, let's say, three or four months, we want it to appreciate with time. The other thing to take into consideration is convenience. If you're going to be managing this particular project, you certainly don't want to be the person that's going to be traveling an hour and a half managing from far away. Something that's close by is, is usually fairly convenient. Now you're going to get into a freehold or a condo. Totally different animals. Freeholds generally, I find, have a lot more hidden defects. Uh, you may have foundation issues, for example. Um, you may have something in the attic. Typically, there's a lot more hidden defects, whereas a condo, like a condo apartment or a condo townhouse, typically is mostly cosmetic. Not as many hidden items in there. Pretty straightforward. There also may be some operational dif differences. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're uh, going to renovate a condo. You may have to go through the board of directors to get approvals. You may have to for example, uh, get um, special permission to access the elevators. So things to consider in that respect. Size and scope. So this is a particular property. You want to make sure that it's one within the size and the scope of work that you're willing to take on. So for example, you got a one bedroom condo versus a four bedroom, 3000 square foot home. Obviously different size and scope there. And that'll also play into effect your price and your budget. So how much financial resources do you have towards something? Seller motivation, really key here. Oftentimes with these properties, we're looking for under, underpriced or under market properties that are distressed, uh, have, for example, some issues attached to them. So that way there is a reason why we're, we're, we're essentially picking up these properties at a discount. Essentially problems typically equal opportunity for somebody else. And again, we're looking for homes with issues. So again, homes that are in poor shape, dated or need work. They may have, if it's a condo, they may have issues with the reserve fund that you may have to deal with. And they may also just be difficult to sell. We've had some properties that you cannot get financing for. They may be in such disrepair that you cannot go to a bank and get typically the, the traditional sort of financing. You may have to get that financing elsewhere, either whether it's cash or private lender. Now, as far as property is concerned, trends are really important. So we talked about appreciating markets. And where are we focusing on are areas where we see some growth. And this, this chart on the right here will share with you what has been happening in April of 2020 and where the growth is. So if you kind of look over to your right, you'll see here that like the key, what you're gonna find here is that affordability is, is still an issue in the city. And that the detached segment, the reason we haven't seen detached homes increase in value a lot is because they're considered unaffordable and expensive. So you'll see here in the 905 area, the average price is about 907,000. And in the last year, it's only grown about, actually not even grown, it's slightly down 0.8%. Meanwhile, your semi-detached homes in your townhomes are far less expensive and they're growing at a higher rate. So interesting enough. Now, in the past, we were focusing also a lot on condos, and I think we're still 
going to go in that direction just because of affordability. But lately, we've seen that condos, uh, because of the COVID-19 situation, have been affected. Um, there may be an oversupply issue uh, with respect, and that part of this to do with Airbnbs not being able to operate. So we're, we're cautiously watching condos to see where the opportunities are. But you'll see here that they look like they're, they're, not, as, um, they're not growing as fast as we'd like them to. So our focus really at the end of the day are townhomes and Sammy's affordable homes, uh, entry level properties. We typically do not focus on million dollar homes just because one, the amount of capital, we're not seeing a lot of growth in them. Um, and essentially they're also just, they, they just take up a lot of the, the capital at the end of the day. So that's, that's really important to understand. Now, as far as property is concerned, there's this myth, there's this popular question I get is when I introduce a property and people ask me, well, Tom, is this a good area? Is, is, and, they, and they ask that question. And really, I don't feel there's anything such thing as a bad area per se or good area. It's, it's really, is it a good or bad investment? And the reason I say that is you can have a property in an area that's considered bad, as you see here, Jane and Finch. Some people would consider that a bad area. However, I can tell you that in the past, we've actually done projects there, over five, and been successful flipping properties in Jane and Finch. So meanwhile, you have some areas which are really good, but if you don't buy them at the right price and there's no profit to be had, then there may not be the right opportunity necessarily. So why I, why I stress this is that you have to be open-minded because oftentimes people, when they, when they start this, they, they kind of look at themselves and they think about the property that they would purchase. And you have to be open-minded to other sort of properties that perhaps you may not be aware of. We're also gonna focus on older areas, areas that we can improve, because you're looking at newer areas, there's generally not much you can really renovate and improve and, and add value. And again, budget. So we talked about um, Toronto. Toronto being very expensive, uh, has opportunity, but they're very expensive properties, so you have to consider that and the land transfer tax consideration. So if you're purchasing a home in Toronto, uh, generally the, the, um, the costs associated with the transaction are much higher, mainly because of the land transfer tax, it's double. So here's another sort of myth, or I wouldn't say myth, but a buzzwords are power sale, bank sale, foreclosures, popular words that we get is they're looking, people are looking for this sort of property. And, and they can be good opportunities, but oftentimes they may or may not be good deals. And what people don't understand is banks don't want to lose money, right? They're not in the business of doing that. So keep in mind that they want to sell for the highest price possible as well in order to recoup their losses. And keep in mind too that the process with these properties are a little different. Now, again, it's not to say you can't find uh, good deals. We've certainly purchased them in the past, but just be aware that just because it's a bank sale does not mean necessarily it's a good deal. You want to do your proper analysis. Now, where are you going to find these properties? There are different sources. There's the MLS. There's certainly deals out there on the MLS that if you pick, if, you, if you're able to find one. Realtors, so networking with realtors, they may have what we call pocket listings or exclusive listings not on the market. Wholesalers. Wholesalers are people that look for private deals and then those private deals are shared with a group of investors and they take a fee in order for, in order for finding these good deals out there. So then that comes from networking. And of course, and then last but not least is direct buying. You could simply door knock or cold call people to see who's interested in selling. And there is a possibility that you may find a good deal doing, doing it that way and save yourself quite a bit of transaction costs along the way. For us, the most effective way is really networking. It's networking through uh, different people and finding out where there might be some good opportunities. Um, because the truth is there's, there are fewer opportunities than there are people who are interested. Meaning that if everyone in this, chat, in this particular webinar said to me, Tom, I, I'd love to buy one, I, I would not be able to supply enough. It's just, it's just, that's how few there are. Now property, again, going back to property, ARV, what does that mean? After repair value. So as I mentioned, one of the popular questions I get is, Tom, if I, if I buy this property at this price and I put in $100,000, and I do these, all these uh, 
renovations, what can I get out of it? What is the potential? And really, it's, it's more of an art than it is a science. Because you may see values where others don't. Most people will take a set of comparables, so comparables meaning sales that, are, that have happened in a particular area and say, okay, based on this property, it can sell for that particular price. However, we have oftentimes exceeded what the potential value may be in an area or the highest sale in that area. So and a prime example of that is we had a, a townhouse that um, we had purchased and the highest sale was 300,000. This was a couple of year, few years back. And we had listed it for 330 and the neighbors thought that we were crazy, that this is definitely way too much. But what they didn't know is that there was a neighbor, neighborhood, uh, a neighboring complex that was selling much higher. And because of that, that helped us basically justify our value. So when it came time to selling, we actually got that price that we were looking for. So what I want to stress is sometimes there's tunnel vision when it comes to comparables and really it comes down to someone that knows the area and understands the value where others don't. And the other way you, there are ways to increase the value. So renovations that are above the norms. So adding premium finishes and lifestyle, scenic views. I've seen before people putting large windows where they have a ravine lot. So again, improving the value through that means adding basement apartments or secondary suites. So an extra bit of income for a potential buyer for that property, adding washrooms, bedrooms, and parking. So again, there are ways that you can basically carve out and add, for example, a master bedroom ensuite to increase the value. Um, supply and demand. I mean, there are just some properties that have, that are rare, um, that are rare finds and people are willing to pay a premium for them. Uh, insider information and development gentrification. So what I mean by that is there are properties out there that people aren't aware that are on the up and up. So prime examples, we had a property where it was nearby a new development. that They were going to basically knock down this mall and create about 10 condos as well as shops and infrastructure. And a lot of people didn't understand, didn't know that because there wasn't anything mentioned unless you were aware of it. So again, that's insider information that a lot of people are not gonna be privy to. There's also the means of severing lots. So you can take a large lot. We see this in, in the south of Etobicoke where uh, people will take a lot 50 feet and then sever it into two and create two homes. Ultimately, what you wanna do is become a market expert, meaning that you're able to identify where the value is and be able to understand where you can improve that. And that comes from really a lot of experience and having the right people that can give you, provide you that information and that insight. So here's a great example. So as I mentioned to you um, about uh, good investment versus bad investment versus good area and bad area. So this, this is a property we actually did, uh, we flipped, it was about uh, two years ago on Jane and Finch. So this is a condo here. You see there's the picture. This is the actual photo of the building. And it was a two bedroom, one bath condo, about 900 square feet. This was purchased by the investor client at 215,000. And you can see here the closing costs, the renovations, they spent about 35,000 just for, for cosmetic renovations, kitchen, bathrooms, paint, flooring, you name it. Holding costs, so that includes your finan financing and maintenance fees. And then you have transaction costs. So what that is is you have um, commissions in there, um, lawyers' fees, et cetera. So all in, they were about 277,000 and they ended up selling this property for 310,000. Interesting enough, we thought we would get 300,000. However, we were able to get 10,000 more than what we had expected. So in three months, this particular investor netted close to about 31,000 net profit off a 200 grand condo. Not bad especially when this is something they're doing as a side hustle. Versus you have this now bungalow in Mississauga. Now this was a, a real property that someone approached me with. Purchase price, again, Mississauga being a good area, solid, this is fantastic. However, let's take a look at the details and the numbers. So you have a potential purchase price of 890. Here are my closing costs associated with the transaction. 
renovation cost. So this is what's going to cost me to basically to, to do all the cosmetic work there. Carrying costs, so your financing, et cetera. You see how that kind of increases so much as your purchase price goes up. And then transaction costs, it's quite a bit. That's because commissions go up as the price goes up. So all in, I'm about a million seventy-eight, and the potential after repair value is about one point one. So in six months, it'd take a lot longer to, of course, also uh, renovate this property, just shy of twenty-two thousand six months. So you see, it's ultimately like which would you choose? And I think the answer is pretty obvious. So pillar, so now we're done property, we're gonna flip, go right into financing. So pillar number two, fi financing. How much money do I need to start? So let's take those two examples. We had the Jane and Finch condo for 215 grand and the Mississauga detached home for 890,000. So as I've mentioned to you, the Jane and Finch condo, uh, to finance this property, we were using 20% down, so it's 43,000. Then you have the closing costs of 5,500 your reno and carrying costs. So that's your renovation and the carrying costs associated with it's 37. So all in this person, this investor put in 85, 80, almost $86,000. The profit, as we mentioned, is 30 grand. So the return when you divide this into that is 35, 35% in three months. And this is what we call the annualized. So if you took that over the course of 12 months, that is essentially the return. But if we compare that now, to, compare that to our detached home of 890,000, you see the down payment of whopping 178,000, your closing costs of 16 grand, your reno and carrying costs, 95,000. So all in for this particular home, you're 289,000. Profit is 21,000. 21, so when you take the 21 grand divided by investment, 7.6% return. Again, this is, this is an exercise to show you uh, the difference between properties as you go up in price. Because what I found some people, they, um, they get lured by more, let's say more luxury properties. Um, and this is something they have to be made aware of that ultimately that it costs a, a lot more, soaks up a lot more capital. And it's not to say I wouldn't do one necessarily. I think I'd be very selective about which one I would, you, would, would decide to get into. Now, where are you gonna get the financing? There are different ways to go about this. So bank financing, typically if you can qualify with the bank will be pretty favorable as far as interest is concerned. So three to 5% interest, it's actually interest is probably lower than that nowadays. <laughs> Uh, plus there may be a penalty associated with the breaking of that particular mortgage, given you're only gonna need it for three months, three or four months. Um, if you are putting 20% down, you will avoid the CMHC fees. So that's the mortgage insurance. Uh, however, generally speaking, if you tell the bank you're gonna be flipping a property, they typically will not finance that property. They consider that essentially business. Another popular way is a home equity line of credit, better known as HELOC. So this is where you take an existing property of yours, you refinance it, and then that refinance money is used to purchase a flip property. The beauty of this, which uh, beauty of this product, what I like about it is you only pay for what you use. So there's no penalties associated with it. And right now this, this slide is, I guess, a little dated because this was before March, it was 4.45. Now the, the, um, the Bank of Canada has dropped the rates by 150 basis points. This is at 2.95%. Joint venture financing. So what is a joint venture? Essentially, that's when you have uh, two people come together, partner up and essentially flip a property. What we have found though, the most effective joint ventures is when one person has something that the other person does not. So meaning that you have a money partner, so someone that has the finances, but doesn't necessarily have the experience or doesn't really wanna get their hands dirty and manage the day to day. That's one person. And then the other person is the, the other one who doesn't necessarily have the financing, but doesn't mind rolling up their sleeves, doesn't mind managing the project, but is responsible for essentially the day to day operations. In those cases, there's a synergistic benefit 
in, in most joint ventures, I've noticed is that people will go 50-50 on everything. And I find that it's just not really efficient when you think about it. So it is another way to go about it. So if you're someone that doesn't have necessary financing, you partner with someone that does, and this way you can split the profits accordingly. Vendor take is also another method. So that's where you purchase a property from the seller and the seller actually finances it for you. So they're being the bank. But what I found about this is that it's really rare in the GTA to come across this. And last but not least is private financing. So private financing is where you, where it's basically not, it's where private persons like you or I have excess amount of capital and they will loan it out to an investor in order to invest in property. Now the beauty of it is that they're not regulated. So they typically um, are very flexible as far as their lending requirements are concerned. However, uh, the interest rate is a lot higher, eight to 10%. There may be also an arrangement fee. Now, many of you people there are probably saying, wow, eight to 10%, that's a lot. When you do the math of the course of three, four months, it's, it's a lot of times worth it. And about half our clients actually go this route because we have a program where we, we have private lenders out there that are willing to loan money. And a lot of our clients who won't qualify with the bank or don't have the financial means will go this, 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 with this method because it's a lot easy, it's very, very easy process. And as, a, as the bullet mentions that you may not require letters of employment or credit check. Um, so those are some of the advantages, really the convenience of, of access to that capital. So pillar number three, so we just finished financing. So we're on to pillar number three, contractors. Um, I know contractors, people have difficulty sometimes with contractors about their frustrations. So we're gonna kind of unpack this. So my, my rule number one, when it comes to flipping properties, if, if you are, is that if you are not a contractor, do not become one. That is my number one rule when it comes to, to flipping properties. Have someone, hire someone that's gonna do the work for you and you manage that individual. And typically that individual is gonna have, the, I evaluate them based on four characteristics, cost, quality and experience, timeliness and attitude, okay? Now, what I have found generally speaking is, and again, this is no knock against contractors, is that it's hard to get all four. Meaning that usually you have, there's always one quality that's usually missing with, with, one of, with, with this part particular individual. So for example, if the person has great quality and experience, is on time and has an awesome attitude, they're, they're usually really expensive, okay? So you want kind of that balance of all those, all those four. We have one, one particular contract that works with us that his cost is, is really competitive. His quality and experience is fantastic. Uh, timely, clean, everything. However, sometimes he has struggles working with teams. So he's, he's better fitted to work by himself. So, so again, he has, um, let's just say he, he struggles to work with teams ultimately. So again, there's always gonna be puts and takes with working with, with different people. So how are you gonna find them? Our number one source are referrals. So asking other investors, for example, is a great way. Um, asking friends and family. Um, but I find asking investors that are in this space is the best way to find people. Uh, you could ask realtors, for example, they will have their network of, uh, of contractors. Um, and, and again, that's usually the best way we found. You also could visit job sites that are near the property you're gonna be working on. So if you see a bin outside, you may wanna knock on the door and see um, who's, who's working there and introduce yourself. Uh, this was an interesting point, early morning Home Depot stakeout. So if you ever wanna meet a good contractor, they're usually first thing in the morning at Home Depot. If you hang out there, you may wanna introduce yourself. Kijiji, I've used this source before. Um, there's a filter much like uh, any sort of hiring process, there's a filtering process involved with that. So you just wanna make, you wanna of course ask the right questions, which we'll go through in a second. Homestar is another website, so reputable, reputable sources there. Uh, and again, investor network and, club, and clubs. So how are you gonna find out if they're good or not? My number one determinant whether someone is gonna be a good fit for me is, is typically to find out how active or passive that individual is gonna be. 
what I've typically found is the person that is going to be um, hands off that subcontracts everything is going to be essentially a passive sort of foreman. They usually don't work with my business model because they're typically very expensive or they're not going to be uh, hands on enough to know what's going on. So I like the, the, the general contractor who is going to be doing a substantial amount of the work and has kind of a small crew with them, uh, mainly because one, they know what's going on. And secondly, because they're much more efficient in, in, in terms of their pricing. So whenever I'm dealing with, uh, whenever I'm screening people over the phone, what I focus on are open-ended questions. So I'll ask things such as, how hands-on are you? How large is your team? Who, who does the work, essentially? Who performs electrical and plumbing work? Do you have a WSIB? So notice that all but the last question, it's open-ended, meaning they're, they're gonna elaborate on who they are. And based on that, you can determine whether this, this person is going to be a good fit for your business. So we prepare a detailed scope of work. So basically a plan of what we're gonna be doing. And we'll normally get three to four estimates. And we'll schedule the appointments on the same day, spread them apart, 15 or 30 minutes apart and walk through with that contractor, the scope of work. Uh, and based on, that's almost like an, almost like a informal interview. With that sense, you can get a pretty good sense of this person is the type of person you wanna work or not with, okay? So um, what you do wanna do though, is based on that, if you find that person is a good fit, possibly they find that's, that they're, that they're uh, paying attention, that they're taking notes, that, um, that they're basically following what they're supposed to be doing. You wanna visit eventually one of their job sites. Don't rely on their photos because photos can be misleading. You wanna actually physically go there and see the work yourself, okay? And some of the things that I look out for, honestly, are very, I would say, um, common sense. Are they, do they call you back or are you chasing them? Are they following the directions on your scope of work? Are they making mistakes already from the get-go? And also, how was their quote prepared? Is it detailed? Is it uh, what you're looking for? Is it, uh, again, you want to make sure that that's a good fit. So the scope of work should have essentially a detailed list of what you're going to be doing. So it would include not only the job, but it was also going to include the type of finish that's going to be included in there. Um, it's also going to specify cleaning, lawn and snow maintenance, um, and you're also going to include their IDs and insurance. As far as initial deposit is concerned, less is better, especially if you're working with someone new. You don't, want to, you don't want to give them too much money and not see it ever again. It's happened to some people, unfortunately. So with new people, keep that amount low. As far as installment payments in the contract, there's different methods. There's percentage of completion, set milestones, as far as like when the bathrooms are going to be completed, the flooring. And what we typically do too, is we have what's called a 10% holdback, meaning that we're not going to pay this full until everything's 100% done. So we'll go up, pay them up to 90%, uh, depending on how, of course, the, how far along they are. And we'll keep 10% plus the HST until we are 100% satisfied that every little, um, every little segment is complete. And as far as the final payment is concerned, so what we typically do, what we call is a lean, we have a lean waiver signed. So what that means is that the, the, the general contractor signs something where they have paid out all their workers. Because if they haven't, that worker has the right to actually put a lien on your property and demand payment through that lien. So by signing this lien waiver, the GC has basically acknowledged that he has paid everyone and does not owe anyone money. Home inspections, which you may want to consider before final payment as well, is getting independent home inspection. It'll not only check the work, but it'll also may, may, may be good to have that as far as when you're selling your property is concerned, you may give that to a potential buyer. So some added sort of credibility there. Okay. So that's really high level about our three level approach between property financing and contractors. So to kind of sum it all up, what we have done as far as our approach when it comes to flipping properties, we keep it very simple. 
meaning that we we facilitate the all all these different segments between property financing contracts to help an investor uh, successfully purchase, renovate, and sell a property. So as far as properties are concerned, what we do is when we find good opportunities, we will go visit that particular property, we'll put an offer, we'll tie up that into our own names essentially as realtors, we'll actually tie that property up under contract, and then we'll offer to our investors on a first come first serve basis. And typically there's no markup on that whatsoever, but this way we've secured a great property because what we found is by the time we call an investor up, we show the property, they think about it, it's gone. So rather than miss out on the opportunity, we'd rather tie it up based on terms that we feel make a lot of sense. Eliminating essentially negotiating, the second guessing, the timing. And then financing. So if someone needs financing, we offer private financing with quick pre-approvals. What that means is that if someone needs, for example, a, a private mortgage, a very simple process only needs 20 percent down and we'll able to get you that first mortgage so it's, it's it's already secure on almost any property and then lastly contractors if you need contractors we have contractors that have worked with us in the past that are able to provide you with quotes we we also help you put together a scope of work and we essentially guide you through that process okay we're there essentially as consultants and then once everything is ready, we go to market, we sell it, and we do it again. That's our process in a nutshell. All right, so guys, I'm just gonna take a sip of water here, and then I'm gonna be introducing our, uh, that's essentially, sorry, that's, essentially, that's the theory behind how we flip properties. But now we're gonna introduce Tina, who's gonna be talking about uh, her experiences uh, with flipping properties. So I'm gonna interview her, and she's gonna share with you uh, some of her past projects. Hi, Tina. Hi. All right there. Just gonna... So why don't you first uh, introduce everyone, uh, tell, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, I used to, um, I'm, I'm a former uh, bookkeeper and I uh, worked as a, um, an assistant to a financial advisor. And I was actually on my way to become a financial advisor, but because of this uh, um, great experience that I had with flipping, I actually decided to become a full-time investor. I, uh, I really enjoyed redesign and staging project management. I really want to know more about it and explore um, to the greatest potential. I love traveling. I usually go to Croatia though, <laughs> because uh, there it's, uh, that's where I come from. You were you were at the you were there during the World Cup, right? When they were in the finals. Yes, I was. <laughs> yes. How was that experience? Oh my gosh, it was it was crazy. You could see um even police didn't care about all the all the noise and all the stuff <laughs> in the streets. Like they were just all celebrating. It was great. I was happy to be there. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I mean, too bad about the Euro this year being uh, pushed back to next year, but uh, that sounds like an awesome experience there. And uh and I can see from the photo there, uh, married for five years. That's Tony on the there, and uh, you've got the, a two-year-old daughter, Hannah. Yes, that's right. Awesome. Well, that's great. So, um, you know, I always like to just start off these these, in, these sort of segments by just asking you, like, so how how do you get started investing in real estate? Um. Well. Um... I just like everybody else, you start hearing stories um, about uh, this rental uh, investments and or pre-construction investments. And my first investment was actually into into a pre-construction condo. Um, then I held it for two years. I had an uh, I, I get a hot, I had a good tenant, but in the end, I really was not so keen about having a tenant and all the liabilities that come with it. Um, and I reached out to you to help me to help us sell sell that property. Um, so that was my first experience with with investments. Now then, um, you introduced us to to a flipping um, kind of business model, and and I really resonated with that. That's for sure. Um, it's from one side, it's it's a short term short term play. 
um, which allows you to re-strategize as you move forward and as you kind of grow your capital. And also, if you have a need for money, quick, quick need that you didn't really plan for, um, you know that in two, three months time, you will be getting your money back and then you can take away from that and then move forward. So you're kind of fully invested with the flipping strategy. Yeah, absolutely. So you, so you mentioned you had a, a condo. Your first investment was a pre-construction condo that you owned for a couple of years. Yeah. You decided to sell it. How, how was, just, just for everyone's, how was the return on that, how, that experience as far as financially speaking? Uh, so I made, uh, I made, so it was a one bedroom apartment in uh, pure downtown. So that would be Spadina and King Street. Yeah. And uh, one bedroom, I call it a shoe box, <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, it was selling for $500,000 back then. Wow. Yeah. I think, yeah, you got fi like a thousand bucks a square foot pretty much, right? It was like 500 yeah. square feet. Yeah, yeah. So my return was around eighty thousand. Amazing. In, in two years, though. No, so, that's that's pretty pretty good there. I mean, you you definitely you know you sold that and then you moved it basically into a different yeah. segment, right? So, I mean, how did this idea of flipping come across exactly? Like, uh, where did well, this idea kind of start from, and then kind of the evolution of it? Well, actually, I don't know if you remember, but I reached out to you because I was just on my maternal leave at the time and I was looking for a new job um, uh, after I'm done my maternal leave to start somewhere fresh and and I asked you if you know anybody who might be interested in you know hiring an assistant and you said well what if I showed you a way to make money so you don't have to work full-time and this is where how we all got started and I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah. and, and kind of like what attracted you to that concept? Like, I mean, I guess, you know, essentially, you know, what were some of your concerns and fears when you were first introduced to this idea of flipping? Like, what were your initial thoughts about it? Well, just um, knowing, how, knowing um, how am I going to evaluate, first of all, the, the, the value of the property when I'm purchasing it? Uh, what will be the value of the property when it's time to sell? And then also how, when I start outsourcing the material and labor, will I know how to combine all three to, to be left with some profit? So that was the biggest concern really, but you guided me through that process. So it, it turned out to be very easy and yeah, sustainable. <laughs> no, that's awesome. No, I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, what, what were your, what your family and friends think, or maybe what did your husband think when you kind of told him, Hey, I want to, I want to flip a property. Like what were their initial reactions? Um, well, we went to see one of the projects that you had going on at the time and you showed us the final product and you also showed us how, how you handle the contractor and finding materials and, and you kind of showed us in, in the real real example how it all looks so it was easy and since my my husband is in the trades he's an electrician we had less fear i mean i had a little bit less fear because i had his background and knowledge that he carries <laughs> from construction side um so that so was kind of alleviating a little bit of the fear but you also definitely provided that, that value of giving, giving the, the proper valuation on time. Yeah. So, I mean, what I, so basically, I mean, seeing it in person definitely helped kind of visualize what is this going to look like essentially, right? right? Adding kind of credibility to this whole idea that people kind of glamorized on, on HGTV, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I personally, uh, we actually were also um, renovating our home at the time. So we already kind of had a little bit of um, that modest experience of renovations, um, but we were doing it ourselves. And so look, at the end of the day, you showed us what the profit is gonna potential, what it could potentially be. When I compared it to my rental property, I, it was a no brainer, <laughs> really. <laughs> okay, perfect. I mean, so since you started this, um... Uh, how many projects have you completed? Uh, four so far, plus our home, so five. Four, five, okay, and that's oh, that's awesome. So in a short time frame, there. 
Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know what, why don't we kind of jump into, we've got two examples here uh, that you worked on. Yeah. Um, why don't we kind of, uh, you know, kind of get into the details of uh, these two projects that you worked on. So, uh, and again, we're going to, we're going to basically apply um, the three pillars I mentioned property mm -hmm. financing and contractors. So let's, let's kind of walk you through this one here. So this is a Tobacco West Mall condo. Why don't you discuss a little bit about the property, you know, uh, your kind of reasons for purchasing it and just give us kind of a uh, Coles Notes overview of, of the property itself. Yeah. Well, uh, when you showed me the, uh, the condo, I was surprised by the size of it. So especially coming from that condo that, I, that we were having downtown previously, this was double the size, even even maybe more than that. And so when I saw it, I definitely got interested in, okay, so what could this be? I knew that the interest would be there, that somebody would be interested to buy this just by, by the fact of the size of the condo. It's actually even bigger than my townhouse at the time that we were living in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was what got me attracted to this condo. And the, you, you did the analysis for me. You showed me the after, after repair value. And, um, and then we got quotes from the, um, from the contractors. Okay, so let's kind of see here. So the contractors here. So now we're kind of jumping to the contractors. So um, oh, sorry. We can... maybe give, give us a sense of who did the work exactly and uh, how did you find this person? Um, yeah, so... Uh, Valdi did the work for me, and um, you referred it. Uh, you referred him to me. Um, he was not the only person that provided a quote, uh, but the end he kind of won because he was flexible enough. Because I said, "Look, I only have this kind of budget to work with, and um, it's not that I'm being greedy, but at the end of the day, it has to be worthwhile. Um, so if you can make it work, make it work. If, if not, we'll." you know, we'll maybe revisit another property another time. The, the key word there is negotiation. Give yourself some credit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely helped me to understand what the budget should be um, and where I should be landing on to, to secure my profit in the end. Um, but um, yeah, one of the contractors were, was more flexible to give me that final uh, final budget price I was looking for. Excellent. Okay. And I guess as far as the financing is concerned, how did you find this finance this particular property? Yeah. Well, I started. Um, I, I actually um, started by contacting our mortgage uh, broker that I was working with uh, mm -hmm. before. Um, but at the time, um, she was not really able to. Uh, find me um, a lender. And uh, I ended up giving the chance to a mortgage specialist at RBC. And she ended up ha getting me approved for a loan. That's amazing, see? So you didn't stop at no. You, you went to go see other potential banks, lenders, yeah. and you found someone that was willing to do it. And I think that's the one misconception with people is when one says no, everyone says no. But the reality is if you're persistent enough, you'll find a way uh, yeah. where it's possible. Yeah, if I can give a little warning there, um, if you do start working and shopping around with too many broker mortgage brokers, what they may end up doing is giving, uh, uh, creating a, um, a same, uh, sorry, a mortgage application to the same lender. If there's any discrepancy in the information being given by your mortgage brokers to the, to the lenders, they may just completely cross you off the list and then you're kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So it's yeah. better, it, like, it, it's good to know uh, one thing with RBC, they don't really work with mortgage brokers. So if you go to them and you go to a mortgage broker, you can kind of get them both started at the same time and see who gets you approved. Oh, that's a great tip there, right? So basically, um, from your experience, you know who works with whom and how to kind of maneuver around different aspects of financing. So, and that really just comes from experience and clearly um, you, you know what you're doing in that, in that respects because you're able to get still bank financing, which is awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, that's, that's great there. So uh, let's take a look at the before and after. So we'll go through the before and afters and then we'll get through the financials, which I think people are, are very interested and keen on seeing. So uh, let's, let's look at this. So we've got some before and after shots here, as you can see, this one being before and the living room, dining room, and this is the after. So maybe you want yeah. to take us through some of the rentals that you did here. So we, we replaced the floors. Um, uh, we installed a nice, we didn't really do much about that then, um, other than a fresh coat of paint and replacing the floors as well. But what we did do is change the, the door to kind of have a glass panel in there to just provide more light. As you can see on the right side picture, it does show more light, even though maybe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I noticed too, you put the pot lights there. So before there were no pot lights, and you put those in here. Why did you decide to do that? Well, you know what, pot lights do give that wow effect. So it's it's a good thing to do, um, if you can, obviously. Yeah, no, it looks great. And where did you get all this furniture from? Well, that's actually virtually staged. So that's one way to save your money. You go and uh, virtually stage uh, for the listing. You don't really have to spend all that all that cost for staging it. So, so there's a hot tip for you. If you don't want to spend five grand on furniture, you can spend a few bucks on virtual staging. So that's a great tip for anyone. Uh, so, so this is the same room, essentially from a different angle. Um, yeah. So one thing I noticed here is that you opened up the kitchen. So here it was closed and then you ended up opening it up here completely. And that created yeah. such a, a big effect. That's amazing. Okay. Everybody likes entertaining. Everybody likes to be... Nowadays, people that are in the kitchen, they want to be included in the conversation that are happening in the living room, dining room area. So if you can open up those walls, it's the best thing you can do. Yep, absolutely. And I think you remember you had to go through, jump through little hoops there and so on, but you managed to get it done. That's great. Yes, that's right. So this photo here is basically the same, it looks like, but um, just a close up of that kitchen, that open concept there that you did. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, sorry, skip there. And then you have, oh, there's your kitchen. So that makes a big difference. Yeah. What are your thoughts on kitchens? What, what do you do for kitchens? What, what's your kind of approach? Well, you, you referred me to um, kitchen uh, vendor. I don't know if that's the kitchen installer. Um, they do everything custom. And that's one good thing about it is there's no, they come in, they do their measurements, they show you what they're drawing. Um, and what the final look should should be. Uh, usually you, you steer away from some crazy colors, um, white or gray kitchens or way to go, just appeals to masses. And um, I like marble backsplash, so that's what I did. That's what I did there. Yeah, that's awesome. And stainless steel appliances look great. Yeah. And then again, so here's the bedroom. So I can see that you didn't keep the lovely red carpet. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, office. So this was a bedroom just made into kind of an office setting, I can see. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah that's a large condo. So the stage yeah. one is an office and shows value. And the bathroom. Um, so if you look at, I, I love this though. On the left-hand side, you'll see the staging with a three- uh, toilet paper rolls here. This is uh, <laughs> a nice ad. <laughs> but you completely rip this up, eh? Like uh, new toilets, new tile, glass shower. I mean, it's uh, completely remodeled. Yeah, what we actually did here, we actually put, um, as you can see, the tub was raised and pushed back on the on the previous uh, previous bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, we actually brought it a little bit forward so that we create more space in that bedroom. Awesome. We didn't really see it necessary to, to create such a big bathroom. It didn't really uh, add value. <laughs> makes sense. And then you have your bedroom. So that's before and afters there. Yeah. Okay. Now I think people are interested. Okay. This, so this is one of the two we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So we kind of look at the numbers. So um, this property was, listed for almost 520 mm -hmm. so it looks like we negotiated a pretty good deal 517 so just uh 3k off the price there yeah so, and your original purchase price was four thousand four hundred thousand one hundred excuse me four hundred thousand one hundred dollars yeah 
with your gross profit of 116,900. Uh, then we, we factor in the expenses. So what I see here is uh, LTT, that's your land transfer tax. So in the city yeah. of Toronto, you have double, just for people's okay. knowledge. Uh, what's this port mortgage rebate? Uh, what's the story behind this 2300? So, so I've, wor I've worked really with a really good mortgage specialist and, uh, at RBC. So she understood and I was upfront with what my intention was, uh, which is to flip. And she helped me um, to, to continue with the same mortgage um, and then to keep it kind of port, to port the mortgage into the next property. So I'm not really breaking off the mortgage, it's just changing the title to another property. And this yeah. way you kind of alleviate that fee. Yeah, so basically you avoided paying the penalty by just transferring to another property. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. Okay. There is there yep, is cool. a little limit. You can only do it a few times um, before they catch on that it's a flip. But yeah, I use the opportunity. Okay, that's awesome. Renovations. So this fifty-three thousand. What does that include? Is it kitchen, flooring? Like just just to give people a general idea. What does that fifty-three thousand buy you? So the contractor's price was thirty-five thousand, I believe, um, which included all the electrical, bathrooms um and all the all the upgrades in in regards to paint baseboards uh flooring installation of floors um and then on top of that there was kitchen installation that was that i paid separately for uh countertops um uh fixtures light fixtures and and a faucet so pretty much everything as far as the rentals are concerned. Pretty okay. Much everything is included in the in that fifty three thousand. Okay. Lawyer, it, that's all of it. <laughs> lawyers' fees pretty self explanatory. Carrying costs. So carrying costs, I assume. Excuse me. Just give us one moment here. It, it would appear that Tom is uh, is delayed here in, in mm -hmm. for a second, but. Uh, You'll be back with us here momentarily. My apologies, everybody. Yeah. So I can talk about. Yeah, that. we can discuss it as, as we're waiting for him to come back. So, so Tina, like your carrying costs there, what would, just so for everybody that's here, you know, that's not an expert like yourself, what would that have included? Carrying costs include uh, maintenance fees, it includes um, interest on your mortgage. And um, sorry, now I'm losing um, I'm interest on the mortgage and property tax. That's pretty much it. Hi, Tom. Are you back? Yeah, it looks like it. I think someone okay. tripped over a cord. It's okay. This is what happens when we're working from home, when we have our kids running around and everything. Every now and then we, uh, we lose power. Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. So uh, net profit, so uh, 22000 and that was roughly, what, three months or so? Three, three four months? Um, that's right. That's right. Okay, perfect. So that's great. So yes. three, four months. And then, so just, just for everyone's knowledge, you're still working full time, but you're doing this on the side, correct? Well, not anymore, but I, at the time, yes, that's what I was doing. At the time, so this was uh, basically okay. So essentially, just for everyone's knowledge, at that time, you were essentially you're working full time, typical nine to five job, and then you were doing this as a side hustle. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, what, uh, yeah, you were saying. One thing that made it easier is had I, that contractor was really making it more hands off for me. Um, so he would really communicate frequently with me to make sure that that all the, the all the supplies of the materials are in line with my design choices that's awesome yeah and that's important so essentially you're you've got a foreman like a, like a the, the gc the contractor is your your foreman and then he has his crew two or three people but essentially you're managing him and you're the ceo essentially so you're able to still work full time and this person's reporting into you on a whatever it is on a, a daily basis or a weekly basis pretty much right yeah, yeah. There was no need for me to go there, um, like every day. 
there's there's no need for that if you have the right contract or that you can trust then that's definitely the case okay actually for everyone's knowledge this is a good question how many hours do you think is spent on this a week <laughs> maybe three three hours okay yeah, yeah. three hours a week it's pretty yeah. good <laughs> overall I, overall i don't think we spent more and both including me and my husband going over there i don't think we spent more than 30 hours the total 30 hours in total yeah so 30 hours divided by 22 do your hour you can do your math right exactly. so it's exactly. not bad not bad there okay that's awesome so I, I might go through this second one a little quicker um but let's kind of go through this one i think this one was your first one if i'm not mistaken it was another Etobicoke right. uh, condo, right? Yeah. Um, what drew you, just again, what drew you to this property? Just a few sentences. Uh, this one had a really good, nice uh, wow effect already from the, from the um, hallway, getting into the property, into the unit. So I, it was at a time, um, the, the property management was investing some money to upgrade the hallways. And then getting into the unit, you saw that big, big open space. I mean, the potential to open it all up um, and have a really big condominium. Uh, like I said, it's a three bedroom, two bathroom and after renovation value of $500,000, it's still a lot cheaper than what you pay downtown. So yeah, good point. That's a really good point. Yeah. Where are you going to pick up a condo? You picked this one up for 382000 Yes. Uh, and it's three beds, two full baths. Yeah, you can see the value right away. Yeah. Um, and, and you financed this one also with the bank, is that correct? With That's RBC? right. That's okay, right. so same, same person as before? Yes, yeah, okay. RBC. And then the contractor, how did you end up finding that person to do the work? Or yeah. Well, you referred me that contractor as well, and um, he already had experience in the same building, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that made the whole process a, a little bit easier. Um, and kind of, we already know the, the, the pro, the, what will be installed. Uh, we saw the example in the same building. So I was, it was easy to pinpoint, okay, this is what I want. This is what I want. This kind of finishes. And, and the quote was pretty much the same. Oh, excellent, okay. So let's kind of go through some of the before and afters here. So you'll see everyone uh, who's online here, you'll see here that the open concept was created. So again, that seems to be a popular theme. Yep. Grays, whites, etc. cetera. Um, all this is virtually staged again, I presume as well, looks like. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so again, you can see that wall was opened up, made such a big difference, you know, that creating that wow factor. Exactly, exactly. So that's your uh, dining room there. Uh, looks like I'm in the, you see me in the shot on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't keep them, I guess we did keep that mirror. Uh, mm -hmm. This is interesting though, look at this room. Um, this is the master bedroom. Talk about uh, difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it looks even bigger in person than it is in this photo. Like it's yeah, it's I agree. Spacious rooms in that in that building. Yeah, for sure. Um, so then you have here the uh, bathroom. So that's pretty straightforward. New vanity tiles, toilets. Again, so it's pretty. Yeah. Somebody asked the question: um, What's the from closing to closing? What's the timeline? For condos, it's usually around four months. So it, because the construction can be done within a month, month and, month and a half. Um, and usually it takes 30 to 60 days closing. Again, 30 Boys, to 60 close the door. days closing. <laughs> Sorry, I've got uh, kids. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I'm expecting mine to come in anytime soon. <laughs> That's what happens. You don't put a lock on your door. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you kept the washer and dryer here. Looks like they're pretty good shape. You just kind of cleaned up, uh, or at least put new tiles and cleaned up. So that's uh, that makes a yeah. huge difference. 
And then you, you, again, a, a, a bit more space, look at the size of that laundry, it's huge. So that's another thing that you don't really get in condos, but. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So, so let's look at the numbers here. Again, we'll kind of go through this a little quicker this time, I think because it's gonna follow the same flow. Mm -hmm. So interesting enough, we list, you listed this property for 476,000 and you sold it for 525,000. Why don't you just maybe tell people how that happened? How'd you sell for more than what you wanted? <laughs> well, you, you kind of deliberately uh, price it low enough to, to have enough people interested in. And that's because of the search factors that happen um, on realtor.ca. People usually put themselves in, a, in a, some kind of a filter limit uh, based on their budget. So if their budget was only $500,000, they, they wouldn't see this property and some people kind of realize after the fact, after they fall in love with the property, they, you know, increasing it for another ten, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand dollars is not such such a big deal um, if you really find what you what you like. What you yeah, like. sometimes people get emotionally wrapped up into it. They say, "Hey, what's another five, ten, or fifteen thousand? So certainly a great, you know, that's an awesome, you know, paying what was that almost fifty thousand above asking? That's amazing. Yeah. So so then your purchase price 382, we talked about that, your gross profit. And then you'll see here, you know, ultimately without going through every single detail, because I think it's was kind of explained it's earlier, 45,000 45, net profit though. That's, that's pretty good. That's right. And that was like your first one, if I'm not mistaken, right? So that's right. awesome. So on average, when you do the two, it's coming out to about 30,000 on average. I mean, you took the 22 to 44 it's, it's yeah. falling around the 30,000 on average per, yeah. per, per property so combined in in less than a year in only if if we take per condo maybe 60 hours of, of no per condo 30 hours of work so 60 hours total hours of work and when you look at $60,000 profit it's it's more than what I make working nine to five what I was interesting uh, so you take the 60,000 divided by 60 hours. I can do that math. That's a thousand bucks an hour. Not bad. Exactly. Not bad at all. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, again, I really appreciate you sharing those numbers. I know those are obviously you're, you're kind enough to provide that information and sharing your experiences. Maybe you want to just wrap up kind of your lessons learned from your experience doing this. Well, yeah, it's, it's a great uh, rate of return on investment and, and, when at the time I was working in an office with financial advisors and when, when I was showing them my numbers, even they said like, there's nothing I can match. There's, there's no investment in the stock market that can match this kind of profit. Um, one good thing about it is there's no infl inflation to factor in. So if, if you look at long-term uh, buy and hold properties, if you sell something after 10 years, uh, first of all, the taxes are gonna be very high. Um, but then you also need to factor in the inflation and what's the buying power of the profit that you made in that property after 10 years. Usually it's, that's something you don't really have to worry about with this. Mm -hmm. but, um, and one, one of the mistakes that my husband and I did with our first condo is that we did the, um, well, we decided to do the electrical ourselves. I mean, my husband being an electrician, um, we, we thought that we would save money by doing the work ourselves. It turned out to not be the case. And mostly because you have to look into delegation and the opportunity cost there. So if he was working on the side as he usually was, um, and making his money in with his clientele, and we have another person making that, making, creating that same work, uh, for us and ob obviously profit potential, and um, you're basically creating double profit at the same time. And this is something that I learned that I'm never going to be doing the work myself ever again. So interesting enough, what you just said is your husband's an electrician, you figured, okay, let's have him do the work because it'll be cheaper. But what you learned is it ended up costing you more in opportunity cost. Exactly. And, and nowadays, what you're saying is on your future projects, you're not hiring your husband anymore. You're, you're <laughs> hiring somebody else. <laughs> for sure for sure we only did it on the first one after that 
Um, after that, we decided that our contractor hires his own trades and that was it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's great. So interesting. So it goes back to, uh, I think what I mentioned earlier. Um, and then you mentioned you're having the right team of professionals. So what, is, what does that mean to you? Well, it definitely makes it easier. Let's say you can't really do the market analysis and after repair value without having the right realtor who will guide you in that process. And the same is true with a contractor, right? If you don't have the right contractor who will make things easier, that you don't have to be babysitting all the time, again, makes the whole thing easier and makes the whole profit more passive, which is what you try, what we all try to do. And, um, and then also things that you need to always consider is the fact that with every profit, there is taxes that are payable to it. So with, it's good to kind of consult all your professionals, lawyers, accountants, realtors, contractors, before you make any investment decisions it will definitely help you make less mistakes and, you know, Awesome. So, yes, <laughs> yeah. So what I'm hearing is it's not just Tina, but Tina. It's Tina and her team, right? It's you're putting together your your members of your team, much like uh, a basketball team has a center, a point guard. It has its different positions. You have people in yeah. your team that are helping you achieve what you want. Absolutely. Awesome. I, you have okay. you know, not that you have to, but it, if you trust the people that do do something full time and they give you the right advice, then you can uh, sleep, sleep rest more, more, <laughs> I don't know, what's the right word? Um, but you can sleep tight at night. That's good, that's excellent. So, I mean, just kind of wrap this up, like what would you say to someone that's thinking about getting involved in, in this or any type of real estate investing, but is sitting on the fence, doesn't know where to start, what would you, what would you recommend? Well, one thing is talk to your realtor. Um, they, they should know um, what is a good investment strategy to start with. And um, it's not for everybody. But then again, a lot of things that you may be scared of can be professionally hired again. So um, I don't know much about construction, but I hired the right people. And, um, and it all makes it easy in the end if, if you have the right people around you. Awesome. Okay. All right, so um, we're gonna jump into questions shortly. Last couple of slides here, guys. If, for example, you are interested in deals, so these are potential properties that you could flip or invest in, we actually have a special buyers list where there's no cost, no obligation, but anything that we feel that would, that would make a good investment, we send it through what we call our buyer channel. So if you're interested in adding your name into this channel, again, there's no cost or obligation, you simply just type deals, okay? That's deals into the, the chat group there, into the Q&A, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll mark down your name accordingly. So go ahead, start typing in deals, and uh, we'll add you to the list. All right. Uh, now we also, on top of that, we also have a special bonus opportunity. So Tina has been so awesome to have, you know, having her today to share the experience. And what we've done in the past actually is we've had what we call a flip tour where we usually go on a Saturday and then we'll visit two or three properties and actually show people in person what we actually do. Now, because of COVID-19, uh, that makes it a little harder. So what we're actually gonna be doing is on Friday, May 15th via Zoom, we're actually gonna be doing, we're gonna be doing this uh, a live flip tour. We're going to visit a property and we're going to show, walk through the home and show you what we've done there. So if you are interested in partaking in that, that's happening on Friday, May 15th at seven o'clock, simply type in the word tour into the chat group. Again, that's T-O-U-R and we'll add you to the list and we'll send you details for that. Again, this is from the comfort of your own home. We'll be basically doing this live at a specific property. So hopefully you can enjoy, uh, you, can, you can join us for that session. All right, uh, and then last but not least, it's our, just to let you guys know, every month we hold a free educational seminar. So our next one is on Tuesday, June 16th, it's how to be a smart real estate buyer, where we answer questions about how to buy properties, the process that's involved, and this has a special COVID-19 update. So again, we're gonna be revisiting COVID and its implications and how buyers can, can take advantage or at least be aware of what's happening. 
And then in July, that we have a very popular segment called Creating Wealth Through Real Estate, where we simply discuss more about investing in properties for the long term. So it's a different strategy from flipping, uh, but we walk you through how that's done and some of the experiences that we've had in the past. So that's happening in July. We don't have a date set, but because we do have your contact, we do have your registration, we'll, we'll send you an invitation for that event. So hopefully you can attend as well. Uh, so now I'm going to open it up to questions and answers uh, from, I guess, the, the panel there. Eric, if you want to kind of uh, moderate that and just uh, fire away. Absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll get started here as quick as possible. Um, what I can see here is Mohammed started us off early by asking, can we still side hustle the same way, taking in consideration of skyrocketing prices? Uh, I, I believe so. I mean, really, I, to me, it comes down to the purchase. So we go back to the three pillars. The property is really important, but it's the price you purchase for that property that becomes really the, the, the kind of the, the foundation for everything. Because if you don't purchase at the right price, then it's going to be difficult to get that ARV. So buying properties at a good discount is really what, what's most important in that. To Mohammed's point, yes, prices have gone up. Um, but again, it's really relative value. And it's also about your budget. So hopefully, you know, that, that answers his question there. But we are still seeing, basically, we are still seeing opportunities today. We're hunting every day for, for these. Yeah, absolutely. So Jay is asking, how could we know that a house will be difficult to finance before we actually make an offer and conditional to inspect the house? Can you repeat the question just so I understood it? I think what Jay is asking is how we had mentioned that some properties are more difficult to finance or unfinanceable by the bank. He's asking right. how can we avoid these homes, I guess, or how can we see them before we make an offer on them? Well, let's put it this way. Um, I can, you know, we'll know in advance to be quite honest, like a realtor that's done this before uh, or any investor that's done this before, will have a pretty good idea if the bank will finance a property. And one of the clear giveaways is if the home has, for example, uh, it's completely destroyed. It doesn't have a kitchen. It doesn't have a bathroom. It has no fixtures. The bank will not finance that period. We did a transaction recently where it had work orders on it from the city. Uh, there was only, there was only uh, the studs. There was no drywall, there were no fixtures inside. So you had to buy cash. So that's, that's one of the, an example I can give you. Uh, it really just boils down to a lot to experience of whether the bank will, will finance a property like that. Otherwise, then you go into alternative lending. So private financing is, is an example. Yeah, exactly. Like we mentioned before, the, the private financing option is there too, right? So you can always find an option. And, and to be honest, those are great opportunities because properties that are more challenged, whether it, they themselves are challenged or they're hard to get financing, that's an opportunity because now you're limiting the buyer pool that can purchase such a property. So I always get really excited when I see something like that. Okay, great. So, so Jay asks again, uh, would you consider a house with a hundred plus years built a low, medium or high risk in terms of condition and hidden defects? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, that has to do with a couple of different factors, I believe, Tom. Yeah, I mean, uh, age of the home is certainly one of the you know things you want to look out for because the age of the home will give you at least a, um, a I'm going to call it a red flag, but it's simply just an indication of some of the things you may come across. So um, type of wiring, type of plumbing. So you just want to be made aware. But, but you could have a 100-year-old home like I have one right now in Toronto, but it's been completely gutted, meaning that it's, um, you know, it's got new wiring, it has uh, new drywall, it has new mechanicals. So really all that's left is the shell and the foundation. And of course you can inspect that accordingly. Um, but uh, definitely it's a valid question as an age of the home can be a, of concern, uh, just given the fact that the construction is, is, could be dated and old materials and just stuff that's really not safe. Okay, great. So, um, 
So Amjad now asks, you know, how would I know the city requirements for renovation and the length of the process in order to calculate my holding cost? I think that's actually a very good question because uh, the answer probably would surprise a lot of people here in regards to how involved the city is in certain renovations. Uh, so the question is, just re repeat how, the question. I heard I holding know, costs in the city. Sorry, I didn't get it all. How would I know the city requirement for renovation and the length of the process in order to calculate my holding costs? <laughs> It, yeah, you know, that's a great question. And the reason is because each city will be different. Um, some areas have faster permitting processes than, uh, than others. Example of that is Mississauga. They have an, what they call e-plans. E-plans, I find, can take upwards of seven or eight weeks, which to me is fairly slow. City of Toronto, 10 business days, typically, in, in a normal sort of situation. Um, so really it is specific to from municipality to municipality. Uh, having said that, some projects may not require city permit permissions. It just depends on the scope of work that's involved. So that would of course make things a lot more um, seamless from a timing perspective. Okay, great. So Jay now asked, uh, how much would you be involved and in how if we have a property in mind, but we don't have a contractor, we would also consider options for finance. Would this be of interest? Um, Tom, I think that we're pretty much involved from point A to point Z here. And I think Tina can kind of attest to that as well in the statement she made earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll leave it with Tina. Maybe she can answer like, you know, just, just let kind of, re, kind of summarize kind of the experience as far as finding the properties to the point of sale. Like maybe you want to summarize that, Tina, as far as know your experience well usually uh, you would introduce me to a property um, and we would uh, we would um, see it um, and then you would show me what the repair value after repair value would be um, if it's more than 150,000 from the purchase price I'm usually okay to go with it if it's a condo right so, so just to be clear what you're saying is uh, your your one hundred fifty thousand is from whatever you purchased it from to what you think you can sell it for. If you have a hundred fifty thousand dollar difference, then that's an indication that you're going to take potentially the next step. Is that is that correct? What I've just described. That's, that's abs yeah, but that also is very dependent on the, the the original purchase price of the property, right? If you compare it to your Jane and Finch, you don't really need one hundred fifty thousand discrepancy in order to make a profit. Um, but I was dealing with uh, properties buying for $400,000 and then selling for uh, 515 approximately. Mm -hmm. so not, not even 150. So you don't even need 150, but right. if you really wanna be on the safe side, this is where you would be landing on. Right, and just to answer the gentleman's question, um, it, let's say, for example, you needed financing. Um, you know, what was your experience with that? Like, let's say on a project you needed financing, you know, what as private lending, what was your experience with that, for example? Yeah, well, if, you're, if you have a good credit rating and um, employment income and you know you could get a loan from the bank, that would be a good place to start. If you don't, there are B lenders options um, that are a little bit more... Uh, flexible in in getting people approved and then private financing is also a really good option if you can calculate in the expenses and still make profit and what and was your experience like with the private financing like as far as the process is concerned and so on oh it's it's so simple because they don't really care about how much your employment income is you don't even need to have any income <laughs> with private lenders they look at the property. If you put 20% down, um, they're, that's enough for, of, of a security for them. And um, you can, it, it, it actually even gives you a better flexibility because you can then put your um, property in on the name of your corporation, which banks won't allow you to. Um, and this actually gives you the, the, this is a good tax saving strategy 
to then um, do it that way. Right, and then uh, just again, the contractor aspect. So let's say you're looking for a contractor, um, how, I guess, easy it is, or perhaps like how resourceful is it working you know, to find them, how resourceful is it to find, like working with us and finding them just, just from your experience? Well, I kind of, well, you already had experience with them. So I trusted your experience. And um, on the other hand, you gave me the option to interview two at the same time. And then what, whatever felt right to me is what we moved forward with really. Um, is it, I know there must be a trust issue, if you, especially if you don't know anything about construction, but I don't think there's anything to worry about because um, you have quite a bit of experience there and, and you can give them quite a bit of guidance how to move and how to evaluate if the, if the quote that they're getting is right. Awesome. Well, thank, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I, th I think what he wants to understand is like, if he needed help, you know, I think he just wants to get an idea of like, how involved are we with that whole process as far as the uh, construction is concerned, or at least the finding contractors, the financing, you know, the, that whole, the whole value chain, as we put it. Well, I think that's what I'm just trying to Guided us along the way through the whole process. And you even showed us which improvements are not worth doing because they're not going to be noticed by future buyers. So it's, it's good to really work closely with your realtor. Awesome. What's, what do we have next there, Eric? So, so next we have two questions that are pretty much the same question, just from two different sources. Uh, what companies do we use to do our virtual staging? And I, I can address that. Um, there's a couple of different companies out there. Uh, like Tom mentioned, the cost is, is very much lower in consideration. Um, the pictures that we showed you came from a company that charges $40 per picture. There are companies that will do it for less. Um, and, and it's just a really good way to get the eyes and the attention that you need on your property without shelling out thousands of dollars potentially uh, to have the property fully staged, uh, especially right now in the time where we're seeing properties maybe take a little bit longer to sell. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I think it's bang on. Box Brownie, check them out online. <laughs> all right great so uh the next question would be from andrea and she mentioned sorry she asked what is your opinion on flipping homes during uh this year during covid will there be issues trying to resell due to less buyers in the marketplace i'm sorry i didn't mean to giggle about covid it's just that at the end of the day this is a question that me and tom hear probably every day I mean, it's a valid question. I mean, really, it's uh, how is it? How is this affected what we're doing? And I think what we're we are focusing more on what we've always been doing, which is let's stick to properties that uh, appeal that are entry level homes that appeal to the biggest pool of buyers, and that is going to be entry level homes. So that has that has not changed. So we're staying away from expensive homes for the reasons we mentioned earlier. Uh, on top of that, when we're buying the properties, I think I mentioned earlier. The key to this, one of the keys is really buying at, at the right price to essentially make sure there's enough of a discount to compensate for uh, these sorts of situations. So right now, we're able to actually uh, potentially pick up properties for less than we would have otherwise in the mar market that we had previous. So really, we are cautiously, you know, trading as far as that's concerned. So if the right opportunity comes, we'll certainly jump on it. But I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, we've been selling, I'll give you a perfect example. We've been selling properties, stuff that's been renovated. And what I've noticed is that nice homes are still selling really well and people are willing to pay a premium, even with fewer buyers out there. We had, for example, uh, you know, one property um, that had maybe two or three showings and it sold and it sold at a great price for that matter. So there's still that there's still people out there that are willing to pay for that for that particular premium even though there are fewer buyers out there yeah absolutely absolutely um especially with the entry-level homes um we're, we're still seeing homes that have multiple offers on them um there are people who still really want to get into the real estate market so it's a, it's a great uh, question but um 
it, it wouldn't be that large of a concern as to what we're seeing. Um, so now we have a couple questions about, uh, you know, port mortgage. I, I think, you know, this might be best answered by a mortgage specialist, but we, we can kind of address them here. Um, when using the port mortgage, what was the time between transfer to the next property? Tina, do you, I, I know the answer, but Tina, you did it. So when she, what was, how much time do you have to transfer that mortgage to another property typically? 90 days. Three you months. Days yeah. from, the, days. from the closing date of your previous property to the closing date of your further property. So there's quite a bit of time too, to get that discount. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, then Francesco asked, do you need to mention your intention to use a poor mortgage prior to being approved for your mortgage, or can you bring this into play anytime throughout your mortgage? Yeah, you can bring it later on. You don't have to disclose that. Um, if you're really working with a nice mortgage specialist, you can be upfront with everything. They're there to help you, because at the end of the day, that's how they get their commission, if they help you. Um, uh, but if you don't feel like if you don't feel that this person uh, can bypass <laughs> some of the general rules that banks like to adhere to, then you you can you can say that your intention is to rent it out Up, after upgrade after you upgrade it because sometimes they do question how are you gonna how are you gonna keep this property if it's not if it's in such a bad shape but if you show them that you have that extra capital and your intention is to renovate it then even more so you're going to be then even easier to be approved because you're going to be putting in the value perfect perfect so angelina santa cruz asks uh, what are the basis that contractors use to determine their estimated value for rentals I think basically, um, you know, I think it boils down to just uh, labor is really just time and hourly rate as far as what they, they're willing to, you know, spend. Um, and then also the cost of materials. That being said, we work on a fixed term contract. What that means is that it will not go up or down depending on how much time they spend. So their incentive is to make sure that it's done in a timely fashion or else their dollar per hour goes down, if that makes sense. So we keep these guys to that contract as far as that's concerned. One of the big mistakes that someone can make is get what we call variable contracts. So you get, uh, you pay somebody per week as an example. Well, even if they're an honest person, and I believe general people are honest, they may not have that extra incentive just to actually get it done. Meaning that they may, you know, psychologically may not be committed to get it as done as they would otherwise. So, that's a little tip there for everybody is uh, hold people to the fixed contracts. Don't, don't pay them hourly. It's a big mistake. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a really good point that Tom just made there. Um, so Roger asked how much money is needed to put a property under contract? I mean, there, there's a different answer. I mean, but the, probably the best that you could have is 20% of your purchase. And then that will give you the return that you're really looking for. I, I, I think maybe Roger might be asking actually about the deposit. So when you, for example, put a, an offer on a property, I think this was referring to is how much uh, deposit you have to put down and that will vary from property to property. But I mean, I've done some deals, uh, especially like private deals where we can go with a thousand bucks and and I've done others where, uh, you know, you have to put 10, 15, 20 or, or 25,000. So it, it can vary depending upon the circumstances. Perfect. And um, Alexi asks, have you hit any roadblocks from the condo corporations when renovating? Uh, the short answer is there certainly are. Um, so what we typically do is we'll get permission from them in advance. Uh, we'll tell them, we'll, we'll be upfront about what we're planning on doing with the property. And then this way, they're not going to raise issue later on. So, um, so, and that's typically what we do. So I think like Tina with that one condo, actually with both of them, the ones we just showed, you got, you approached the property manager and basically got their permission and blessing. So there were no roadblocks per se, right? That's right. You, you definitely want to get that permission before you get any work started. 
um, even if that means um, getting the permission, kind of having a meeting with the property manager before you even purchase or having that as a condition um, on the purchase and sale agreement. Um, I, I don't know if you, maybe Tom, you can kind of give an input on, on the purchase and sale agreement per se, but um, um, you definitely got, want to make sure that the renovations can be done. Yeah, actually, it was interesting because we had a, this is a very uh, we had an interesting example just recently where one building was not allowing new renovations because of COVID-19 and they're reopening it next week. Um, again, that is kind of a very isolated example and, you know, something that's unprecedented. But, you know, that that is an example of where uh, it did come into play. But typically we do. Um, I mean, typically always we do get the permission from the property managers and the boards, whatever approvals are required. This way will make your process a lot more seamless. Yeah. Tom, would you mind uh, also commenting on the tax perspectives of, of flips? Because I've noticed some questions here. Oh, about tax. Okay. Yeah, great. I was a CPA, CA. Yeah, that's usually a popular uh, topic of discussion. So uh, for people who want to know about taxation, um, flipping is considered a business, business income. So by the very rule of the book, it added to your, if you're having your personal name, it gets added to your um, income and gets taxed accordingly. Uh, some people I've seen try to maneuver that and try to call it capital gains. By its very definition though, it is not capital gains if you ever do the research on it. So um, it is it's taxed that as, as business income. Now, in order to pay less tax, if you decide to make this something more frequent, you can actually incorporate that business and then you're paying corporate tax rates, which right now after a small business deduction is 12.5 or 13% up to $500,000 in profit. That's, that's amazing. Like you, you can't really beat that as long as the money's kept in the corp. So, uh, but that is a, a very tax effective way of, um, of doing business. Yeah, and there are different ways to put properties or profit, profits from the flips into the corporation, but something to, I guess, to be discussed with the, with the accountant. Um, but you don't have to really increase your own personal tax bracket and pay the extra taxes if, if you already have high employment income. Yep. I see one last question here. What is entry, uh, entry level price? I guess it depends on the area, um, but let's just say West GTA, which is what we focus on. So Mississauga, Etobicoke, um, Rexdale, Brampton, you're probably looking anywhere between 300 to 650 in that range, uh, typically for entry level. Yeah, I hope that answers that question there. So Eric, you want to just uh, read out the last question here from Angela? Yeah, um, Angela has a property she would like to flip, so she just wants to know where to sign up and get started. Um, Angela, we will reach out to you directly, and we will um, start you on with the process. Tom, would you like to add to that? Yeah, we'd love to see what you're up to, and we'll tell you honestly if it's uh, – if it's even worthwhile to pursue. I mean, there are people who have approached me and said, hey, Tom, I found this property. I think it's a great deal. And I can literally analyze it within five, 10 minutes and tell you if you have something or not. Uh, we do, like there are, based on experience, we can evaluate properties pretty quickly um, just by using some, I wouldn't call them rules of thumbs, but just metrics that we use to kind of say, okay, do we have something here or not? Um, and I'll elaborate more about that uh, when we get in touch. Perfect, we look forward to that. Um, Mark C asks here, you know, could you, uh, could you not claim as capital gains if you were paying income tax from a small business? So admittedly, I am not a tax accountant. Um, I'm going to defer that probably to your account and see if there's some way to maneuver. Uh, so I wish I could give you a better answer than that, but that's probably going to be, um, the, the best thing to, to recommend at this point. Yeah, absolutely. That would probably be the best thing that you can do is to speak to your, your comment directly. So does anybody else have any other questions they wanted to sneak in here quickly? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I see one actually, sorry, in our, in our chat that just came through um, from Manji. It, isn't it difficult to resell a property banks don't finance? Uh, yes, it is. However, when you when the property has been renovated, then it becomes it's, it's been it can be financed after. So once you install all your finishes and fixtures and whatnot, uh, the banks will finance it. So at that point, it becomes marketable. And the beauty of it is that a lot of these buyers remember you got to remember who your buyer is. The buyer is looking for a turnkey property that looks that looks nice, and they don't want to do it themselves. And they may not even have the financial resources to do it because they may only have 5% down. So what a great opportunity that you're going to provide them with a turnkey home that they only have to put 5% down. So, so keep that in mind, because I don't think we touched upon that, like who our buyer is and, and why people are buying these sorts of properties for themselves. Because there are people who cannot literally buy a property that's dilapidated uh, if they don't have the capital to actually even do the renovations themselves. Okay, great. So uh, I do see a question here um, about the presentation and, and asking if you know that e we can email the webinar. Um, by all means, anybody who would like a copy of the webinar email to them, they can mention that in the chat here and I will copy, uh, oh, sorry, I'll forward that to you tomorrow once we've gone ahead and processed the video. Yeah, a couple other questions popped in here. Um, I think uh, I'm Jed. Yeah, Amjad, I think, is the question that we'll move on to. Roger, I think it's best um, Tom and I can follow up with you directly to discuss this further. Um, Amjad asked, how would I determine the profitability of a project if I don't know the cost of the rental before owning the property and consulting the contractor? Well, that, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, really boils down to uh, experience. I mean, you could use some rules of thumb like uh, cost per square foot. Uh, it, it just really varies on, on the type of project at the end of the day. Um, but ultimately, if it's something that's really unique, then it's advisable then, of course, to bring in someone that can uh, at least give you an idea of what it's going to cost. Because there are some projects, honestly, that you'll scratch your head and be like, I'm not quite sure exactly. Like, I think it's this, but um, it's better than to bring someone in and then properly validate that number or at least give you a better uh sense of what it could be yeah absolutely okay so uh, if, if nobody else wants to ask anything else that will conclude our portion of question and answer yeah that's awesome guys so thanks for um thanks for being here with us this evening i hope you got a lot of value out of this presentation I uh, especially wanted to thank uh, Tina here for um, being here tonight, sharing her experiences. I mean, this is, you know, live is not easy for anyone to, to do necessarily. I know this is your first time doing this, Tina. So that's wonderful that you, you stepped up and appreciate sharing your, your stories. And, and it seems like, uh, it seems like things are going really well with this. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for all the opportunities you have given me. And um, um, thanks for having me tonight. It was an honor. Awesome. And Eric, yeah, thanks for moderating tonight. Uh, you did a, a magnificent job as always. Uh, again, guys, if there, if you'd like to, um, again, sign up for um, any of our, any of our deals or participate on the Friday tour, uh, we will be more than happy to have you sign up and we'll take it from there. So in that case, have yourselves a great night. And again, if you do need to reach out to us, I left my contact information there and we're happy to you know, explore any of your questions in more detail. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Everybody have an excellent night and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night, bye everybody.